Good morning. morning. Well, you have no idea how good it feels to say that. (laughs) Um, I'm very glad to see you. Glad to have those of you who are joining us on Facebook be with us as well. We hope you're having a blessed day in spite of the fact that we have a little liquid sunshine going on outside. I want to say a a word of thanks to everybody that uh, pitched in over the last couple of weeks. It was a strange couple of weeks. Uh, for me personally and for us as a church uh, to have both your pastor and also our our regular church musician out at the same time was a bit of a trial Um, we're grateful for everybody that that helped in the interim we're glad to have marty back with us this morning who's filling in for dan Uh, dan i heard from dan this morning Uh, he's feeling better he'll be ready for choir practice on thursday so we're we're grateful for that um, good news and bad news. Uh, the uh, good news is that while you lay around in the hospital for a couple of weeks, you get plenty of time to think up new sermon material. <laughs> maybe it isn't good news and bad news, but anyway, the, the better news maybe for you this morning is uh, you're not going to get all that right now. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to try and dole that out over the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, A couple of other things. Um, First of all, uh, we're revising the date for receiving new members uh, two weeks from today. So on February the 18th, I'll be receiving new members. If you haven't already um, touched base with me about that, uh, please do so as soon as you can. If you are interested in formally joining the church, I'd be glad to hear from you uh, and explain to you what uh, the process is. Uh, Also, keep in mind that um, on February the 14th, it's not only Valentine's Day, it's also Ash Wednesday, just the way the calendar crumbles this year. So uh, our Ash Wednesday service will be uh, at 7 o'clock that night, and uh, you can come if you want to receive ashes, great. If you don't want to receive ashes, you can still come and be a part of the service, that would be fine. You also received with your bulletin this morning a uh, communion offering envelope. We receive these each month uh, and they um, benefit our church's building fund. So if you're able to uh, do something a little extra above your regular offering for the building fund, that would be great. All right, all of that said, If you are able to, would you please stand and join me in the call to worship. This is God's world to us, given a vision of nations and races, 
lands and people join together in love. We come to celebrate and renew that vision, opening ourselves to the one who is its source and its living fire. Our first hymn is number 89. Please be seated. Well, I was watching uh, the service uh, last week uh, online and uh, very appreciative of uh, the presence and the participation of my friend and colleague, Reverend Dottie Johns. Uh, Dottie started her ministry as my assistant uh, a number of years ago at a church in New Jersey and um, <laughs> the first year that she was my assistant, uh, I was having uh, spinal problems and I had to have spinal surgery. And uh, when, when the doctor and I chose the date for the surgery, uh, I didn't pay quite enough attention to the calendar as I might have. And so I had the surgery on the Wednesday before Palm Sunday. Dottie thought that this was going to be her opportunity to preach on Palm Sunday. Uh, she didn't reckon with how stubborn I am. 
so on Palm Sunday, four days after spinal surgery, I was standing in the pulpit with a big neck brace on, uh, doing my best to preach, and Dottie and my wife were sitting out in front of me, fuming and making faces at me the whole time. So uh, I'm, I know this is going to be a surprise to some of you, but I'm pretty stubborn uh, when I, when I want to be. So, but I, I so have looked forward to being uh, back with you. Our district superintendent uh, came to see me in the hospital uh, last week, and one of the things that we were talking about was our identities uh, as pastors. And uh, this is something that most of you can identify with in one way or another. Uh, being a pastor isn't about what you do. It's about who you are. And, and you could say that if you're a police officer, if you're a teacher, you know, it's not about what you do, it's how you identify, it's who you, who you are. And so, um, I'm not sure exactly where I was going with all of that, except to say that I just, I missed you uh, for the last couple of weeks, and I'm, I'm very glad to be back here. So, all of that said, let's turn to our unison prayer of confession. And let's say it together. Holy God, before your splendor and glory, we fall silent, aware of our human frailty and sin. Who are we to speak your word of love or spread your gospel of truth? Yet only speak your word of forgiveness, only touch us with your healing fire, and humbly we will respond to your call through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, I'm going to guess. Billy, did you put something in the box? Yes? Okay. No. no. All right, who put something in the box then? Lynn. All right. And we have a cross and a thing called a carabiner. These are, these are things... Uh, that mountain climbers are very well aware of. Uh, nowadays, of course, they're used for all sorts of things like this as a, a key hook, I'm guessing. Yeah. So, okay. Well, it's, it's a good thing to have a cross attached to a key hook, isn't it? Uh, the symbolism is pretty clear. Uh, you and I uh, are inheritors of the, keys, of the keys of the kingdom because the keys of the kingdom belong to Jesus. And you and I belong to Jesus, and so the keys that he has are the keys that we have. And any of us who seek entrance into the kingdom of God, all we need to do is take hold of that key, which comes to us in Christ Jesus, and entrance is ours. He'll be there to uh, meet us and greet us and welcome us in. Hopefully not yet, uh, but... In a way, as we live every single day, we live in the kingdom. Uh, so we, have, we kind of have one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom of God, and that's how Christians live. We live kind of on that edge there. Uh, so uh, anytime you're concerned about your position uh, in the kingdom of God, just have a, have a look and make sure that you can hold on to the keys of the kingdom because Jesus is a part of how you live and a part of who you are. Okay? All right. Now, Holly's going to share with us. How's that? There you go. Okay, Billy, let's see if you know what this stuff is. First of all, band-aids. Band-aids. And what do we use band-aids for? Hurt. Yes, if you get hurt, you can use a band-aid. How about this? Medicine. It is medicine. And why do we have medicine? Because we cut the germs. 
You might not know what this is, because this is for old people. Back. It's to help your back heal. All of these things, thank you, are to make us feel better and to heal us. But do you know who the great healer is? Jesus. Jesus. You're exactly right. Jesus heals us inside and outside. Are you ready to pray with me? Yes. Okay. Dear God, you are the true. You are. You are the true healer. Healer. Thank you for healing us. Thank you to heal us. Inside and out. Inside and out. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you to Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that, after all, is the purpose of the Christian life, to be more like Jesus. All right, if you're able to, please stand and turn to hymn number 614. Be seated. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother in law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. 
So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. I think that the first time I ever heard of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright was in a song by Simon and Garfunkel uh, when I was a teenager. And uh, the song was So Long, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I love that song. Uh, over the years, we've learned some things about Mr. Wright, uh, both as uh, an architect and his impact on the uh, the design of America's buildings, uh, but also as a person. He was fond of telling an incident from his life that happened when he was nine years old. Uh, he was walking across a snow-covered field with his very reserved, his very conservative, no-nonsense uncle and as the two of them reached the far end of that snow-covered field, his uncle stopped him, and he turned him around and pointed out their tracks through the snow. Now, the uncle's tracks through the snow were uh, straight and true, like one of the furrows of the field, but the boy, Frank's tracks, uh, were all over the place. They, they meandered all over the field. And his uncle said to him, notice how your tracks wander aimlessly from the fence uh, to the cattle, to the woods, and to the stream, and back again, and see how my tracks aim directly toward my goal. Uh, there's an important lesson in that. And that's an incident from his life that stayed with Mr. Wright. And, and in later years, he liked to tell how the experience had contributed to his philosophy of life. He said that he determined right then and there not to miss all of the things in life that my uncle had missed by simply walking a straight path. He saw in the tracks that wandered all over the field what his uncle was unable to see, and that is that it's easy to let the demands of life keep us from enjoying what God has given us. Some people get so focused on the destination that they fail to appreciate and enjoy the journey. I remember teaching my daughter how to ride a two-wheel bicycle. We were in a place called Sea Isle City, New Jersey at that time, and uh, between the church and the parsonage, the parsonage was right next to the church at that location, but there was a parking lot between the two buildings, and I was teaching Leslie how to ride a bike on that parking lot. And you'll probably remember it from when you learned how to ride a, a two-wheeler yourself. 
Uh, your first tendency is to look straight down right in front of the bike as you're trying to keep your balance. But you learn after a little bit, you get a little confidence to, to raise your eyes because the part of the trick of keeping your balance is seeing the longer picture, not missing the things that are out there because you're so focused on what's here. Way, way, way too many people live their lives focused right there on, on the next step, what, whatever the next step might be. And in keeping such a narrow uh, focus, on keeping such a, a concentrated attention span on the thing that is just in front of them, they fail to appreciate all of the other gifts God gives in life. And that's what Mr. Wright was trying to say. We all know that any goal in life that's worth achieving uh, demands sometimes a great deal of our time and our energy. And, and we couldn't live very well if we didn't have some goals and work to fulfill them. Uh, no reasonable person would argue uh, contrary to that, I think. But what Frank Lloyd Wright discovered at the age of nine, some people hardly ever learn that the objective in life is not the goal, but the journey on the way to the goal. The picture that's going to be on the screen in just a moment, that one, uh, that is a church, believe it or not, a very, very modern, spaceshipy looking kind of church. Uh, but that is in the village of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that church is suspended uh, over top of the ruins of a house from the first century that is believed to be the scene of today's Bible reading. Uh, so underneath the floor of that church are the ruins of Peter's house. And it's a wonderful church. If you go inside, you, the seating is circular and in the middle of the, the church floor, the floor is made of glass. And so you sit in the seats in the church and you can look down onto the ruins of this home from the first century where this Bible story took place. It tells us that the whole city was gathered around the door of that first century home and that the people were pressing in uh, because they wanted to see Jesus. Word of his presence had gone out uh, around the area and the demands on his time were beginning to pile up. The, the gospel tells us that he cured many people, he cast out demons, he taught constantly. And for their part, the disciples weren't an awful lot of help right then and there. Uh, when he left in the early morning to pray, uh, they didn't leave him be. They kind of went out in search of him. And when they found him, they said, what are you doing? Uh, everyone is searching for you. Uh, they were a little bit like Frank Lloyd Wright's uncle. Their, their focus was on getting this done, getting things done, doing things that they thought had to be finished and not letting Jesus be what Jesus needed to be and do what he needed to do. It's hard sometimes to enjoy life's journey when everyone and everything is searching for you and wanting a piece of you and demanding your time. And so we have to struggle with questions about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, one of the things I had a lot of time to think about over the last couple of weeks, you know, why do I do what I do? It seems as if Jesus never had any time to himself except those moments in which he deliberately went off somewhere alone. Uh, and even in the privacy of what should have been a, a, a a sanctuary for him there in Peter's mother-in-law's home, 
still people were after him because they, they needed his healing power, they needed his touch. G.K. Chesterton uh, once mused that Jesus went off by himself in order to laugh. It's an interesting idea. Uh, in other words, when he couldn't stand the kind of ridiculous expectations that his friends and followers kept making of him, eventually he just went off to laugh, just to, to keep his sanity. I don't know about that. That's an interesting speculation. But what we do know is that everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. And maybe he went off just to get some peace and quiet for a change. The crowds saw in him someone who had the power to do things. They wanted him to get things done. There were plenty of people around who could talk, and there are always plenty of people who talk a good religion. But Jesus, there was something different about him. He didn't just talk the talk. There you go. He made the blind see. He made the lame walk. He made broken people whole. And as more and more people saw this, the, the size of the crowds grew. And, and as they did, he gave of himself and he, he gave and gave and gave. But he didn't forget that though he could not live without communion with the Father, uh, he, if he was going to be forever giving of himself, he needed also to receive. In this respect, we're reminded of his humanity. Remember that he was fully human and at once fully divine. So he knew exhaustion. He knew mental and spiritual fatigue. He understood what it meant to be running low on resources. He knew that in order to spend his time in serving others, that he needed some spiritual reinforcements for himself. He needed time in prayer. He needed quiet time. He needed time apart so that he could have communion with God the Father. And friends, if that was true for Jesus, how much more must it be true for us? In our humanity, in our weakness, in our temptation to sin, in our times of doubt or worry or grief or uncertainty, what do we do if we've not had regular communion with God? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We get weak, we get discouraged, we become afraid, we become anxious because we've run low on resources. When life circumstances or the demands of the people around us, however benign they might be, are draining us of our spiritual strength, how much more do we need God? One of the primary causes of spiritual burnout is a lack of a vital prayer and devotional life. If we're not spending regular time in communion with God, you and I are not operating with all of the resources that are at our disposal. Listen to this, this quote. This comes from John Stroman in his book, God's Downward Mobility. He says, burnout is not the result of too much activity. It is the result of the wrong kind of activity. I think that's an important insight. When I did my doctoral thesis, uh, it was on the uh, discernment of the spiritual gifts of God and how they might be used in and through the church. And I, I began my writing uh, by thinking about 
the episode from Exodus chapter 3, in which we're told that Moses encountered God in a burning bush on Mount Sinai. And Moses marveled at the fact that the bush burned but was not consumed. And, and what I wanted to say uh, as I began my discussion of spiritual gifts is that if you and I are aware of our spiritual gifts and if we are using them correctly, then we can be like that burning bush from Exodus 3. We can be on fire but not be consumed. One of the problems I have seen with members of my congregations over the years is that people come into the church and they get excited about being a part of the church. And I love that. I love when people are excited about being a part of the church. And they begin to take on this job and that job and that kind of service or another. And I always watch because I always worry that somebody is going to take on too much and get themselves burned out. We need to be busy in the right ways, doing the right kinds of things, not just doing everything that comes down the pike. If we're doing the right things, if we're using our gifts appropriately, then we will not only not get burned out, but like that bush, there will be even more energy. We will even be more on fire for God than, than we were before. So one of the things that I want to encourage you to do as you think about your own service to God in and through the church, whatever it might be, ask God to, to, to show you whether or not you are right in his will on that matter. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Or are you like the one sister, Martha, who just was busy and busy and busy and busy with everything? and didn't pay too much attention to what Jesus said was the more important thing, devotion to him. We're, we're guilty, many of us, many of us are guilty of being engaged in the wrong kind of activity. Lots of people running around doing good things and working for God, and, and I love that people want to work for God, but maybe they're not spending time with God. A little boy was walking along the road with his father and they happened upon a large stone in the road. And the boy looked at the stone and was obviously thinking about it. And then he turned to his father and he said, do you think that if I use all my strength, I can move that rock? And his father thought about it for a moment and said, and he said, yes, I, I think that if you use all your strength, you can move that rock. And so that was all the encouragement the little boy needed. He ran over to the rock and, and he put his shoulder against it and he started to push it and he pushed and pushed. So hard that uh, beads of sweat appeared on his forehead, but the rock didn't move at all. And after a bit, the little boy sat down on the ground next to the rock and he was crestfallen and he looked at his dad and he said, you were wrong. I, I can't do that. I can't move it. And his father walked over to him and he knelt down beside him, put his arm on the boy's shoulder. He said, you can do it. You just didn't use all your strength. You didn't ask me to help. Sometimes we think it's all up to us. Sometimes we think we're the only ones that can get something done that we believe needs doing. And because of pride and our own sense of independence, we, we try to be strong and we try to do what we think needs to be done without asking anybody else for any help. Life tends to 
try to teach us that we can't count on other people when we need them. And yet, faith tells us the exact opposite. Faith tells us what we should have known forever, and that is that all we have to do is ask. And we have a ready resource in God, and we have brothers and sisters who will help us if what we're called to do is what God wants us to do. And and therein lies the answer to the question that is posed by the sermon title today, why am I here? Jesus knew why he was there. He told the disciples, this is why I came. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. We're made to spend time with God, to have fellowship with God. That's why we're here in general. That's why we're here in worship. We're here to replenish our spiritual resources because you and I know that we cannot make it on our own. We're here to offer uh, to God our songs of praise, our prayers, our gifts, and ourselves because in our offering of our worship and praise to God, we are filled with God's strength and grace and mercy. We're here to receive of the grace of God and unlike the material resources of the world around us, there's an endless supply of grace. And it's one of the great paradoxes of faith, kind of like the the bush that's on fire and yet is not consumed, that the more we give ourselves to God, the more we are filled and renewed ourselves. And all of those things in us that were weak or worn out or trampled down or burnt out can be strengthened and made whole. So friends, why are we here? We're here to worship God. Because in worshiping God, we have our resources renewed. We are strengthened. We are made whole. All of our broken bits are brought together, covered over by the blood of Christ. And we go back out into the world as people who are now again ready to face whatever demands come our way. Because we have been with Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. As we turn to uh, God in prayer this morning, we want to, of course, keep uh, Dan in our prayers as he recovers. um, And as he returns to the choir on Thursday, we'll be continuing to pray for him. Uh, Also, this is the last day we're going to see Bob Cranick for a little bit. Uh, Bob's going to be headed over to the Cleveland Clinic to have some surgery and will be away from us for a couple of weeks. So let's keep Bob in our prayers. Uh, And uh, we're we're glad to have Marty Koch uh, be with us this morning. But uh, we want to invite you to keep Marty and her family in your prayers to her. Her brother passed away last week uh, and they were up in uh, Minnesota for the uh, service for her brother and we want to just pray for a peace of heart and mind for their family. All right, and as uh, I mentioned before, I was very appreciative of your prayers on my behalf. Uh, I certainly felt them uh, while I was uh, separated from you. So uh, we have a new prayer course. We have done this one uh, before. Marty will play it through for us and then we'll sing it the second time around.
today. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be more mindful of the gifts you have provided. Help us not to be so singularly focused and so narrowly focused on whatever the next step might be that we miss the bigger pictures of life. Help us to have a broader perspective, O oh God. Help us to appreciate all of the beauty that you have shared with us. The beauty that comes in creation, the beauty that comes in our relationships with one another, the beauty that comes in our relationship with you. Help us to know why we are here. And that it's not always to be busy with this or that, but it is to be using the gifts you have given us appropriately so that we might continue to burn in our passions for you and for your kingdom. We pray that you will be with all of those whose names are on our prayer concerns list. Oh God, you know what their needs are before we do. Be with each one according to their circumstance. We're thanking you that Dan is feeling better and that he anticipates being back with the choir on Thursday. We pray you continue to bring healing and strength to him. We pray for comfort and peace of heart and mind for Marty and her family as they mourn the loss of her brother. We pray too for Bob as he goes to have surgery. Uh, Lord, we pray you'll be with the doctors and the nursing staff that will be caring for him, that the surgery will go well, and that he'll have a good recovery from that. Be with Joan while she worries about him. Oh God, I give you thanks for all of the people who took care of me over the last couple of weeks, doctors and nurses and technicians and all of the others. Thank you too for those who shared with me expressions of concern and who prayed for me and with me. We thank you, O oh God, for the church, for its ministry to the people not only within the walls of the church, but to the people in the world around us. Help guide and direct all that we say and do. We pray that you'll continue to be with the people in the world who are suffering because of conflict and war. Oh God, we all saw the sad sight of American soldiers being brought home and laid to rest this weekend. We pray, O oh God, that whatever needs to be done in order to bring peace, that it will be done. We don't know what it is. O oh God, the, the, the whole issue confounds even the experts. But we do know that if people lived like you teach us, if we truly lived the way you'd have us live, that these things, these things would go away. There'd be no more hate, there'd be no more war. And so help us, O oh God, in whatever small ways we can to embody your presence in this place. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, friends, our ushers will be waiting upon you now to receive your gifts, tithes, and offerings.
Let us pray. God of power and patience, we gather in worship to wait on your presence and to be filled with your power. Jesus healed with a touch and taught us that you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that they might be used to bring healing of body, of spirit, of broken relationships, healing of a planet that is groaning under our carelessness and greed, healing of a world community that is deeply divided by distrust and self-interest. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. My right, friends, please be seated. Uh, as always, I want to just say a couple of words about communion. You are seeing me right now sanitize my hands. I am the only person who will be uh, touching the bread. So as you come forward, uh, just bear that in mind. If you still have concerns about that, there are some prepackaged uh, cups of juice with a little wafer tucked into the top if you want to use those rather than receive the the, the bread and juice from over here, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Also, in the United Methodist Church, we observe an open communion. You need not be a member of this church. You don't even have to be a United Methodist. We ask only that you come truly seeking to receive of the grace of God. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. All right, friends, this, this is my bit now. <laughs> On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ, that we might be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Since, dear God, in this place, at this table, we have touched, we have tasted, and we have heard the signs of your love for us. Grant that we may go away from this house filled with our love for you and overflowing with your love for those who are around us and who share our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right, if you're able to, please stand for the singing of Blessed Assurance. All right, friends, just a reminder that right after the service, we have a time of fellowship and refreshment in the next building. We hope you'll join us for that. Now may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this day, this week, and forevermore unto eternal and everlasting life. Amen.